welcome to Your Health in Your Hands. I'm Dr. David Ajibade with the Brain and Body Foundation. And we are living in troubling times. We all know this. We see this, we hear about earthquakes in the Philippines. We hear about the bushfires in Australia taking up almost a quarter or a third of the country. We hear about what's happening in Iran with the US and Canada and all those things going on. We also hear about coronavirus in China and there's a big scare going on there. And we're not exempt. In Nigeria, of course, we're dealing with Lassa fever. And if you remember, when we had the DG of NCDC, the National Centers for Disease Control, uh, Dr. Ehekwazu, he came and talked about what they are doing and what the government is doing to try and keep this under control. And their, their ministry and their, the, the Ministry of Health is doing a really, really good job where that's concerned. Now, we have today no other than the Minister of Health himself to come and address the public and to help enlighten us on what's going on with where Lassa fever is concerned. And the bottom line is that you have no need to fear if you do the right things. So we will be right back. Don't go away. Okay, welcome back. Lassa fever. And we're also going to talk about coronavirus as well. But on me on the show today is none other than the Honorable Minister of Health in Nigeria, uh, Dr. Osage Ehanire. Yeah, welcome, sir. Good morning. Good morning, sir. It's a honor to have you on the... On well, thank the, you for inviting me. Appreciate you making the time to do it, sir. So, Lassa fever. We're looking at over 40 cases, fatalities, deaths so far. And over... How, how many people are we suspecting have Lassa fever right About now? 256 as of last night. 256. And 40 fatalities, uh, 19 states. Well, that should be of some concern to the ministry. It is of great concern, and that is why this opportunity to have some public messaging is very welcome, uh, yes, because the focus, the focus uh, like in any other uh, situation, is prevention. Yes, we want to talk more about prevention, uh, messaging the population about what to do to avoid uh, this uh, high incidence. Absolutely. And there are some focal areas that your ministry is particularly interested in. So, I, mean, I know we've seen cases all in all 19 states. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, in 19 states out of the 36. But are there areas that you're particularly concerned about and want to really tell the healthcare professionals and healthcare workers and the people living there to, be, to take special caution to about? Well, there are areas where the endemicity seems to be very high, where we usually have the highest cases, the highest incidence, and those are Ondo, Edo, and Bonye. The reasons are not very clear yet. Mm. But uh, in the middle range come uh, Taraba, Bauchi, and Plateau, uh, and then uh, sporadic uh, occurrences in the other states. Yeah, because Lassa fever is, I mean, traditionally we think of Lassa fever as something that happens in dry, dusty areas during the dry season, and the states that you mentioned are not in anything but the dry parts of Nigeria. Well, uh, they're not the dry parts, but it's a dry season. That is a high season for this kind of disease. Uh, the rainy season usually is extremely low. Uh, the connection with the rat, uh, the multi mammoth rat, is still very uh, much at the forefront, and it is believed that at this time of year, uh, the risk of their uh, leaving the bush and entering a house uh, houses is high mm -hmm. and also going to look for food uh, where humans store food and uh, during that occasion they deposit feces and urine uh, fecal matter which uh, contains a virus mm. so that brings us to the question of environmental and personal hygiene does it not extremely environmental personal and above all food hygiene mm. uh, the uh, rats are looking for food and if they uh, get at your food, uh, they leave their footprints and um, urine and, and, and the feces behind, you unknowingly will partake or consume of it, and then that is the uh, chain of infection. So uh, we're also talking about people who have, the, the, culturally, many people just kind of like dry their food outside. Are we talking about that as well, or just stored food? That is a very, very staunch uh, uh, index, a suspicion. The uh, food dried outside, which people leave outside on the street or on the, on the road, or it's uh, highly at risk. Mm -hmm. So we do recommend that the food is covered in a wire mesh, or you can, uh, in a rural area, also put it on the roof. It's less likely to be invaded if it's on the roof or somewhere more secure where you are uh, sh more certain that uh, 
uh, rodents will not get at it once you turn your back. Mm -hmm. Because at this time of year, they are looking for food everywhere. They find it and uh, behind your back, they go and take a bit of your food and uh, leave a virus behind. So we need to be particularly concerned where it comes to, to hygiene and, and, and not being careless. I think we, we tend to be a little careless. As, yes, as I think we are we presented with, uh, with, with health. And I think that uh, there's need for uh, strong social and behavior change communication in this respect. Uh, so we change our ways of doing things mm -hmm. and don't give uh, vectors uh, much of a chance to uh, get at, uh, at, at, at us. At us, yes, definitely. Let's take attention to um, the NCDC and what the DG um, has has been doing in color, well, under your direction, of course. Sir. Um, we had Dr. Hekwazu on, and he also, a few, some time back, and he also came to talk about the importance of awareness, education, but also the importance of uh, what you just said, being presumptive. We, we, we have a fever, we think automatically it's malaria rather than testing. And I think from what we've seen, we've heard a lot of good report about the NCDC and what they're doing to uh, deal with that mentality. Um, testing centers, where they, you mentioned the rapid response team that has been uh, uh, delegated to about how many states now? Yeah, at least five states. About five states. Okay. And what exactly is their, their role? Well, uh, there are states where you have uh, a sort of endemicity, which I mentioned now, uh, Ondo, Edo, and uh, Ebony, where there is a uh, lot more awareness about Lassa fever. There is a higher index of suspicion, even among the health workers, the doctors. Mm -hmm. So when they see cases of fever and try to treat for malaria and there is no response in a short time, their mind already goes to Lassa, so they are quicker. Uh, on the draw than uh, those other uh, doctors in states where they don't see much of Lassa fever. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is in those states that we have seen many of the casualties uh, that we have seen recently. Uh, in fact, the uh, case fatality rate for Lassa, which a couple of years ago was about 30%, mm. has dropped to 15%, which means that uh, instead of losing 30% of patients mm -hmm. nowadays with improved treatment and faster treatment, we lose 15%. Uh, oh, fantastic. We hope to bring uh, that figure to zero. To that zero. is the plan. Yes. But again, use the opportunity to uh, alert doctors and other health care givers in, in other, all parts of this country uh, to have a higher index of suspicion. If you see a case of a fever, uh, we are treating with, with malaria medicine and Panadol and you don't get a response in a short time or the symptoms appear to be getting uh, worse, go to a health care facility immediately. And the doctors also who see these cases should immediately let their mind go on to the possibility of uh, testing for Lassa fever. And I think that's, that brings up an important point because there was a recent report about four or five healthcare workers in Kano actually contracting the disease. As a result, and some say because they didn't take these precautions, they didn't have this high index of suspicion, they didn't uh, partake of the protective uh, control measures that have been put in place by the NC NCDC and the Ministry of Health. Yes, that's true. Kano is one of those states that had uh, very low incidence of uh, Lassa fever, so the case did uh, come in. Uh, it was uh, pregnancy and, 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 and bleeding uh, during uh, term pregnancy, mm. and the doctors uh, performed the cesarean section quite with all the best intentions, not uh, thinking of anything. Mm. And uh, it turned out that this lady actually had Lassa fever, and unfortunately, uh, the healthcare workers were infected that way. Mm -hmm. I was in Kano over the weekend mm -hmm. to um, see the situation myself and speak to the Amino Kano teaching hospital where it happened and all the measures for pre prevention have been uh, taken. They lost okay. two staff and two others who are uh, recovering uh, in treatment and about 213 who are uh, being uh, monitored. 213? Yes, monitor. Those are the contacts, those who they were in contact with during the period, just watching that they don't develop symptoms. That is a routine practice, that if you have an index case, you monitor all the contacts in the family uh, in case they may have contracted it and uh, uh, watch them for a period of time, like two or three weeks, and after that you uh, relax your guard. Is there a way, let's say a healthcare professional in Gombe, for instance, has this high index of suspicion, are the testing kits readily available? 
The testing kits, uh, the testing kit is a, is a PCR laboratory. We have five of them functional now. Okay. And doing very well. Uh, our one was the last one to get uh, a very functional PCR machine. And uh, the uh, protocol now is to send the sample as fast as possible uh, uh, to Abuja or to the nearest uh, testing center where the uh, test will be given to you within a few hours. We have very rapid uh, ways of doing this test. The laboratories are open around the clock so they can do the tests as quickly as possible so you get your result rapidly. That's one of the great improvements uh, at the National Nigeria Center for Disease Control. So you can uh, immediately start treatment or if you can't treat, immediately put the patient in an ambulance and convey them to a treatment center. Uh, at this point, uh, um, uh, the Honorable Minister and I will have to take a break. <laughs> We've just been informed by the directors. We'll be right back after this break. Okay, welcome, welcome back. I'm here with the Honorable Minister of Health, and we are talking about the Lhasa fever outbreak in Nigeria and what the ministry is doing in collaboration with partners and the agencies like the NCDC to keep it under control, but also, more importantly, to educate you, the Nigerian citizen, on what you need to do to keep yourself safe, to keep your family safe. So, so thank you again for, for being on the show with us today, sir. Um, we've talked about identification. We've talked about some of the states that are involved. Let's talk about uh, treatment. Once a person is suspected to, be, to have the disease, Lassa fever, Lassa fever, what are the things in place? How, would, how, how, are they, how are they being treated now? Well, uh, we have uh, quite a few treatment centers, and uh, we have, luckily, is one of those uh, diseases for which we have uh, uh, treatment, uh, something called ribavirin. And uh, it is uh, given to those who are already infected uh, early enough, and we have the tablets given to those who are highly suspected of being infected. But uh, like with all uh, ailments, the time to start the treatment is of essence. So we uh, do encourage people who uh, feel uh, they have an ailment like that to go early enough to the hospital so that they can be assessed and diagnosed and treatment can start early. Chances of survival are higher the earlier the treatment uh, starts. Of course. of course. Yes. And is there something that the, the state governments can do to help facilitate this? Yes, the state government can help a lot. We uh, like better relationship with the state departments of public health, uh, particularly with uh, case finding and reporting. We also uh, solicit assistance of uh, state governments in logistics. Uh, the uh, Ministry of Health uh, and the NCDC have a, a mechanism for getting samples from state capitals to testing centers. But the challenge of getting uh, samples from um, local governments to the state capitals mm -hmm. uh, is what we need uh, support for from states, from state, gov uh, state governors, uh, because that is a challenge, uh, bringing a, a, a blood sample from places uh, to the state capital where they are picked up by NCDC. NCDC doesn't have the resources to go into to every, every local government right. in the country. Uh, but we can do that from the 36th and Federal Capital Territory. I understand that the challenge is uh, particularly um, high for those very large states like Niger and Taraba with large area. Right, so I do believe that uh, here particular assistance is needed uh, with regard to logistics, the use of motorcycles or whatever. But uh, these uh, samples are specially packaged and they need to be uh, sent uh, uh, early enough and uh, packaged properly uh, to be sent to uh, the laboratories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you've, of course, you've reached out to the governors and the, and the, the co cooperation is, yes. is high? Yes, the cooperation is uh, solicited at, at all opportunities. Uh, when we have a, uh, the opportunity to brief governors uh, at the governor's forum, mm -hmm. or also when there is a meeting of uh, National Economic Council, we do touch on subjects that are of common interest. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly where we need uh, a better synergy uh, between uh, federal and state governments. 
and uh, at state level for between the state and local governments. Right, right. And we hope for the, there'll be more and more synergy, especially in this this part, this, this period. Um, I've been keeping tabs with on, on the NCDC too because I've been very really impressed with the, the the control, the structure, and how they've really taken this this whole idea of infectious disease to to to, ta to heart to heart to really address it. Yes, uh, the NCDC deals with uh, diseases of public health interest. Uh, uh, public health security and uh, we also uh, when the situation is dire also report to national security advisor mm -hmm. because uh, these uh, are things that uh, come out of the sudden and they can uh, really have quite a lot of effect on the economy if you are not uh, uh, fast enough to curtail those such outbreaks absolutely so uh, the cooperation of general population is very important uh, the uh, state authorities and local governments and above all the messaging uh, mechanism we intend to open a dialogue with the Ministry of Information mm. uh, to improve messaging right. uh, particularly with regard to those uh, behavior uh, behaviors behavior patterns that uh, uh, tend to um, provide more chance for disease spreading right so that we can uh, have a more preventive uh, measure our focus on prevention uh, is cheaper than cure absolutely and uh, we also wish to have uh, of course the capacity to respond to any disease uh, uh, case management absolutely yes speaking about infectious disease sir, um, corona virus is becoming a growing concern should we be concerned about it in Nigeria or West Africa? Well, I think that all countries need to be concerned. And as a matter of fact, all countries are concerned. Uh, we are following very closely uh, the development of uh, the uh, coronavirus uh, epidemic and uh, taking measures here in Nigeria to ensure that Nigerians are safe. Uh, we are uh, looking at what other countries are doing. Uh, it's uh, a good example that China itself is uh, putting certain con uh, cities under restriction to uh, limit the possibility of uh, people carrying this uh, uh, disease outside, right. which is uh, probably quite helpful. Yes. And also uh, we are here are looking at uh, airports as probably the only primary uh, channel of uh, entry into our country we are not looking at i mean we are we are, we are land borders but that is not so likely but the air borders so we are looking at uh, screening uh, all passengers who come in more intensively and uh, we have uh, thermal cameras installed at the um, international airports mm -hmm. check all uh, passengers passing through and anyone who is su su suspected is uh, interviewed very politely and uh, we take the travel history where he has been to, mm -hmm. especially if he's coming from the Orient. Right. Uh, we want to know where, uh, how long he has been there and how long he has been traveling, so that uh, if there's any suspicion, we know what to do. I think that's really, really important. So, so uh, any other things that you really want us to pass across to the general public? Very important is not to panic, not to be afraid, mm -hmm. to listen to uh, public uh, announcements, and also to improve personal hygiene, domestic hygiene, and also food hygiene with regard to uh, both the Lassa and coronavirus. And uh, also not to resist uh, healthcare workers because there are stories of uh, some citizens uh, uh, being hostile when they are being uh, advised on yeah. health behavior, <laughs> and uh, particularly those who are stuck to certain behavior patterns. And uh, so, but there need to be some social and behavior change in uh, with regard to um, how we manage food and manage our own environment, sanitation, hand washing, and so on. Those are extremely important, particularly also again looking at um, if you have a cold or you have a cough, you try to restrict yourself, uh, stay within your room so that you don't spread to your own family, your children, and your uh, loved ones, and uh, use a handkerchief or tissue when you have to cough or sneeze and discard it not to cough directly into the open or sneeze directly into the open mm -hmm. and uh, avoid crowded places and uh, also uh, uh, report immediately if you feel that you are getting very unwell.
Mm -hmm, absolutely. And this a lot of it has to do with common sense approaches to health and hygiene, doesn't it? Well, it has. Uh, but common sense, as we know, is not that common. <laughs> so we really do need advisories. Yes. And uh, to uh, let people know that you, uh, apart from uh, what you have been told uh, here and there, there's still more to learn with regard to looking after yourself and looking after your family. We, we also know, we talk about infectious disease a lot, but we also know that black people in particular are more prone to certain conditions like hypertension, cardiovascular disease, um, cancers, diabetes. And uh, we, we know that it, uh, we, when I spoke with Dr. Hekwazu, Hek they were saying that's the next step after we've taken care of the infectious diseases. But um, I know with the public health departments and other departments, we are already pushing towards that. Uh, anything you would like to share with us with regards well, to yes. non-communicable diseases? Well, yeah, you are correct. In fact, we are worrying now about the increase in non-communicable diseases. Yes. And uh, looking at uh, the problems that non-communicable diseases will bring up in the future. But again, a lot of it has to do with what we eat. Our food pattern has changed over the last mm. 40, 50 years uh, since we have been uh, relating with, with Europe uh, and, and with the rest of the world. And there are certain foods that we consume in excess, mm. which uh, is it's being described as actually not very good for the health. We dispose of yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so we, are, we are discovering, for example, that uh, consumption of too much salt mm can entertain hypertension yeah. and we should reduce salt that we take. It's also uh, coming out clearly that uh, consumption of excess consumption of sugar, particularly with adults, can be harmful in that that is what predisposes to diabetes. Mm -hmm. and, and so we are also asking uh, for moderation and serious reduction in sugar consumption, particularly with those who are uh, already uh, past a certain age of, right. of 30 or 35. Right. And uh, so that you uh, save yourself what might be coming. You might not see it immediately, but uh, it comes up. And then the uh, practices of what kind of oil you use, what do you cook with. Uh, uh, people are departing from natural palm oil, natural granite oil, and going to other kinds of funny oils that we don't know anything about, yeah. which uh, do, to some extent, have uh, suspected to be connected with uh, uh, problems of uh, sclerosis arteriosclerosis and cholesterol. Yeah. So, uh, uh, processed food, a lot of processed food that we are consuming. Which, which have a lot of uh, salt, by the way. They have a lot of salt and a lot of preservatives, mm. the preservatives that uh, allow them to keep, which you definitely consume mm. along with the food. Now, what is the effect of these preservatives in your body? So, uh, we advocate fresh food, fresh food from the farm, fresh from the field, uh, fresh catches of fish, and, uh, and, and, and meat. And again, of course, looking at uh, meat, a lot of uh, uh, meat that we eat uh, coming from the poultry and, and perhaps even beef that is, uh, has consumed a, uh, quite a bit of uh, antibiotics during uh, when, when they are being raised. Yes. And uh, you consume the antibiotics too. We are worrying about the antimic antimicrobial resistance, resistance that yes. is growing yes, from that source. Yes. So uh, these, all, all of these affect your health. Mm -hmm. And uh, also certain uh, behaviors that uh, uh, appeared now and then out of nowhere. The last we heard was that some people are tenderizing their food with Panadol. They put Panadol to cook the meat, yeah. which is absolutely absurd. We don't know where that comes from, but um, the suspicion that boiling um, Panadol can break down, break it down into chemicals that can damage your kidney. And we have a large incidence of kidney diseases going on yes, right we now. Do. A lot of yes, people who need dialysis, for some reason the kidney is damaged and we suspect that all these uh, uh, crazy practices are responsible for uh, diseases that uh, are not, were not so rampant before. We've been trying to get the NAFDAQ uh, DG to come over and talk about that too. Maybe, maybe you can help out with that. Yes, we can facilitate that. Uh, she has the responsibility to monitor what we eat yes. and uh, med the medicines we take and uh, uh, we have been talking a lot about that. We are into uh, health promotion. Uh, the easiest way for a doctor to start looking after his patient is disease prevention and health promotion. Absolutely. So we are deeply into health promotion, disease prevention, uh, which 
costs a bit but saves you a lot more absolutely uh, uh, in the long run so absolutely. you reduce your disease burden absolutely sir it has been a great honor and i want to say thank you again sir for taking the time and thank you for coming to thank you us. thank you for inviting me we appreciate it sir thank you there you have it folks uh, this we have been on with the minister of health dr osage Ohanire, and he has uh, given us a great amount of information to share with you remember your health is in your hands be sure to join join with us next week uh, and all the different times we're on about five six times a week probably sometimes even seven times a week so be sure you don't miss any of our programs god bless and see you soon